Good morning. Speculator, Lake Pleasant, Pasico. There's only a few people over there, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I once uh, I went to a conference from the Evangelical Free Church, which we were part of, or still are part of, actually. And I remember the district superintendent made a statement, and he said, if we could just get 1% now, you have to realize I was in the Eastern District, which includes New York City and Philadelphia and Washington, D.C. Um, and he said, if we could get 1% of the people in a, in, you know, in, a, in a radius, I think he said something like a 10-mile radius, um, our churches would be full. And I said, well, um, I went up to him later, and I said, uh, last week I had 10% of our county in church. No, it was 5% of our county in church. And he just looked at me and smiled. And I said, well, you see, our county, he said, how could that be? I said, our county has 4,500 people, and we had 200 and about 210 people in church. That's, that's 5% of our whole county. And he just looked at me and with disbelief that there could be a county in New York State. And I said, oh, and by the way, it's one of the largest landmass counties in New York State. I said, we have more deer and bear and, you know, even moose. We might have more moose than people. I don't know. But anyway, it's good to be back in Warrensburg again. And I guess I'm going to be here for two weeks. Uh, I'll be back next week. So we're going to do kind of a two-week series. I call it um, uh, Christ-Centered Counseling 1 and Christ-Centered Counseling 2. And what I'll do is I'll just kind of walk through a little bit of our counseling philosophy. Uh, really, we'll be walking through some of Colossians. Uh, at Adirondack Bible Chapel. I put some of these on the back table back there. Uh, some of you do not know, over at Adirondack Bible Chapel, um, we have a ministry center. It's, it's a large facility. It's on 250 acres. Um, we have people come from all over the world that come, uh, come there for discipleship and counsel. And uh, sometimes um, people are in a crisis. Uh, we have a family from Hungary arriving. I'm picking them up at the airport Tuesday. Another family from Hungary. We've had people from Egypt and Asia and South America, and as well right around this area. Um, we had a young man just recently from Northville. So um, people come, and you can take a look at this. If you have any questions, feel free uh, to talk to me uh, a little little later. Go back to open your Bibles, if you would, to Colossians chapter one. And um, as we as we just look at this, this is uh, I had. Um, I can't remember your name, brother, but I uh, came up to me and said it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture, um, that prayer of Paul. And just hearing it read again, thank you for reading it so clearly, because I love it too. Uh, it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. But just looking at it just quickly, um, we always thank God our Father. That's, that's verse 1 of chapter 1 of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we pray for you, when we pray for you, um, since we heard of your faith in, in, Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing. It also does among you since the day you heard it. Understand the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our dear uh, fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and is made known to, to us, your love in the Spirit. So as we look at this, um, I'm just going to briefly give you a, a picture of what we do in biblical counseling. Um, and by the way, when people come to Adirondack Bible Chapel Ministry Center, we tell them, you are coming to a church. We don't do, it, isn't, it isn't a separate uh, organization. The Ministry Center, Adirondack Bible Chapel, it's all Adirondack Bible Chapel. So we tell them, you're coming to a church. So you're going to be part of the body of Christ. You will be discipled by people in our church, um, and, and they have uh, discipled many people. So um, just to give you an idea, I'll give you three, uh, quickly, just, just three things we look at. And it's a local church-based, Christ-centered uh, counseling that always points to the power of the gospel to change lives for the glory of God. Very simple, very simple statement. Local church Christ-centered, Christ-centered counseling that points to the power of the gospel. Now, many times we think of the gospel, we'll get into this a little bit next week, we think of the gospel is that which we get saved and then we move on to deeper things. That is not what Scripture teaches at all. 
Scripture teaches us that the gospel, yes, it is by the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in the gospel that we are saved, but it is also that which teaches us to say no to ungodliness and things and move on to live godly lives. So we look at the power of the gospel, and that's part of our counseling, uh, central to our counseling philosophy. Number two, it's, it, it is accepting God's word as true and sufficient. The sufficiency of Scripture, the truth of Scripture. I know Aaron, your pastor, Pastor Aaron, he's a good man, and I know he stands on the sufficiency and authority and inerrancy and all of those things of Scripture. Amen? Would you agree with that? And, and I praise God that there's a pastor here that stands on those things because they are becoming fewer and fewer in the churches that will actually stand on Scripture and say it's true. It's not only true, it's sufficient. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, we read something along the lines that says, His divine power has given us everything we need. Now the us there is believers. He's talking to believers. So His, God's divine power, has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. And we get a knowledge of Him through the Scriptures. And when He's talking about us, that's us. And when He's talking about life and godliness, that word life isn't just like bios, alive, it is zoe, live, like we, the word we get zoo from, okay? So it's, it's, it's an abundant life. So that's the sufficiency that we see uh, in Scripture. His divine power has given us everything we need through our knowledge of Him, who called us by His own glory and goodness. And then number three, it's just everyday believers living Christ-exalting, God-glorifying, Holy Spirit-filled lives in front of other people and are willing to sacrificially serve. If you look at Adirondack Bible Chapel uh, website, if you pull up staff, now I'm retired, right? So I'm not, some people say, well, what do you do now you're retired? I say, I do everything I used to do, I just don't get paid anymore. <laughs> um, but if you look at staff, you'll see a picture of our church. You know, it's like, I think it's a view looking down like this. That's the staff. All right, our staff is a church. Every single person that desires to be involved in this ministry, and hopefully we, we encourage all the people, whatever their skills are. We have a group, we had a group come up, it was so neat this weekend from uh, New Jersey, a youth group, and you know what they did? All day, went, uh, Friday and Saturday, they stacked 24 cords of wood in our woodshed. Big, because we have a wood boiler, you know, so they're big chunks. They're not little things, you know, these are, these are great big chunks of wood. And that's what they did. They served the Lord so that we can now heat that 14, 16 bedroom lodge um, with wood as we do through the, through the winter. And, you know, that's serving. That's serving the Lord. We have, we have folks in our church that, that just do maintenance on the equipment um, and all kinds of things. But there are people that are also gifted, and I'll go into that a little bit further, with a knowledge of the scripture and a willingness to pour into people's lives, and we encourage them to do that. And then we have people that just love having people over for dinner. So anyone that comes and stays at the ministry center on Wednesday night and on Friday night, you're in someone's home in our church for dinner, right? So we have those people and they serve and then they get to know the people. So I look at that, it's just everyday believers. That's, that's me, I'm an everyday believer. I never went to seminary, pastored for 30 years, finally figured it out, and then I retired, okay? So um, everyday believers living Christ-exalting, God-glorifying, Holy Spirit-empowered lives who are ready and willing to sacrificially share the gospel in their lives with other people. That is our basic biblical counseling philosophy. Sufficiency of Scripture, pointing people to Christ, the truth of the Word of God, and then living living that life alongside of people as we live life. And that's what happens at the ministry center. People used to come and live in our home before we had the, the facility. And they lived life with us in our home for, for many years. Now, you don't have to do that. Although we do have somebody living with us. It seems like we always have somebody living with us. So these, these three points stand in contrast with much of what you see even in Christian counseling um, today. Uh, and that's, that's unfortunate. Um, many people have come to us who have experienced some of life's really most difficult problems and who have come out of some kind of counseling philosophy 
that has been infiltrated with the world's thinking, and they have found no joy, no peace, and unfortunately, we end up with those people many times. Um, and many times they're on medication, which is medicating the symptoms and dealing nothing with the problem. Um, and they're believers. They have the Spirit of God living in them. Um, sometimes they're not believers, and they think they are, and they come to the ministry center, and they come to Christ. Of course, we rejoice uh, when that happens as well. But unfortunately, these treatments, even when administered by Christians in their professions, are focused on the problem. Uh, they, they, how to deal with the problem, how to alleviate the pain caused by the problem. And, and my purpose in this series is not to dissect that or analyze that or, or, or criticize uh, any particular uh, counseling method. It's to show that Christ-centered, gospel-centered counsel always points to people to Christ as the answer. And if we believe 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has given us, and I, I usually say this in our church, you know, and I have a bunch of people correct me, his divine power has given us most things that we need for life and godliness. And all of a sudden you'll hear a rumble out there, right? No, no, no. His divine power has given us everything, everything we need. If you're a believer here today, if you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, for your salvation, his death, burial, and resurrection, you have everything you need for life, life, abundant life, and a godly life through your knowledge of him who called you by his own uh, glory and goodness. So what is a, a definition of Christ-centered or gospel-centered counseling? Uh, I'll give you a, a quote from an author that I read, Jay Adams, years ago uh, in his book, Competent to Counsel. Jesus Christ at, is at the center of all true Christian counseling. If you go to a Christian counselor and he doesn't have his Bible open and he's not mentioning the name Jesus Christ, get up and leave. <laughs> Because that is not Christian counseling. And this is what he says. He says, Jesus Christ is at the center of all true Christian counseling. Any counseling which moves Christ from that position of centrality has, to the extent that it has done so, ceased to be Christian. If you remove Christ from counseling, it's not Christian counseling. You may be getting counsel from a Christian, but it is not Christian counseling. He says, let, let, let us turn to Scripture, therefore, to discover what directions Christ the King, the head of the church, has given concerning the counseling people with problems. The Scriptures have much to say concerning that matter, and oh, do they ever. The Scriptures are filled with counsel and always points us to Christ. Now, in Colossians, if you want to have your Bibles open, Colossians chapter 2 tells us, Christ, in Christ are hidden all the treasures and wisdom of, and knowledge. Do you believe that? In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, in, in Scripture we, we, we read, and actually in Colossians, as you continue into chapter 2, you read that it was Jesus Christ who was at the, the head of creation. It is Jesus Christ that holds all things together. The reason you're not, you're, all the atoms and molecules in your body aren't just exploding right now is because Jesus Christ is holding them together. He is in control of every single thing. There is not one errant atom floating around out there that is not under the control of Jesus Christ. He's holding all things, all things together. So in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So where do we look for wisdom and knowledge? We look to Christ. Colossians 1.24 says, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. I hope you believe that. I hope you believe that. There are only two, two examples of a description of the power of God in Scripture. You would think maybe it would be thunder or creation or, or something like that, you know, causing the flood. No, you know what they are? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation, and Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. That's it. So you want to experience the power of God, it's through the gospel and through Jesus Christ. Then why would believers run anywhere else for help than to running to Christ and his body, the church? Unfortunately, many times the church feels inadequate 
or we have bought into the lie that we need professionals instead of what Christ has given us. So a major problem facing the church today, I think, in, in, in my opinion, is that, um, and it, it really, the, the secular counseling philosophies have permeated the church, and we've lost that picture of the centrality of Christ and his gospel. And rather, we run to man's wisdom for answers to our, our problems. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3.19, for the wisdom of this world is what? Foolishness in God's sight. The wisdom of this world is foolishness. So rather than running to Christ and drinking deeply of him and then having rivers of living water flowing from our hearts, the church has done what Jeremiah talks about in Jeremiah 2.13. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. That's basically what has happened to a lot of counsel, even Christian counsel, um, in the church because we have moved away from the centrality of the gospel of Christ and the word of God and the sufficiency of the word of God for uh, looking for counsel. Now, this just isn't saying you all should be counselors. This is what we counsel ourselves. When I need counsel, you know where I go? I go to the word of God. And I go to my wife. And you know why I go to my wife? Because I think she has almost the whole Bible memorized. <laughs> That's nah, an overstatement. Um, when I'm preaching for 30 years, she sat right, right there in front of me. And I would be going for a verse and she'd be mouthing it. <laughs> All right? And I looked, she made me look really good. You know, I'd go, I know that verse. And I'd be looking at her. <laughs> but the reason I go to my wife many times for counsel is for the simple reason that she's filled with knowledge of the scripture. She's filled with goodness. She lives her faith. And therefore, I know I'm going to get biblical counsel when I need that. So um, that's, that's what we want. If we truly believe Romans 8.28, does everybody believe that Romans 8.28? Anybody know that God is working all things for what? For the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So is God working all things for good for everybody? No. No, there's going to be a lot of people that he is not working for their good. And they will face his judgment. But he is working all things for the good of those who love him and are, who, call, who are called according to his purpose. That is the believer. He's working all things. Now, if we know that, if we know he's working all things for our good, then we have to take that situation that we're in and look at it and say, what, what good is God doing in my life through this situation? What is he, what is he doing? I, this is tough. I want to get out of it. I, I, somehow I want to escape this situation, whatever it is. And yet, if, if the Word of God tells us that he's for the believer, he's using it for your good, then shouldn't we stop and say, well, for what good? What good is he using it? Just flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if you have your Bibles open. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I don't use PowerPoint, okay? So I'm used to, in our church, everybody has their Bible, and when, you know, they're constantly flipping through their Bible. So I'm sorry if I don't have, I don't know, I don't know what Pastor Aaron does. But so 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And what do, we, what do we see here? We see Paul saying these words, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. I don't know whether you've ever been to that point. I think uh, I've maybe edged on that a few times been so burdened and afflicted that I despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Now that's about as low as you're going to go. At the ministry center, we have people come suffering from depression sometimes, and they are really low, very low. Um, and so we, I think that's basically where Paul was at this point. But, that, that great word in Scripture, <laughs> right? But... That was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. There was a purpose for this. And, and what the Lord wanted to do is get Paul off his eyes off himself and actually get his eyes off the problem and on to Christ. 
That's, that's what it, the purpose there. And many times we have problems come in our life and we're so focused on the problem that we never look up to the purpose of that, what God is bringing into our life so that we will then focus on the God. Oh, I love the way he says, not just focus on God. By the way, focus on the God who raises the dead. Okay, just in case you were wondering whether this God could fix your little problem. Oh, by the way, he raises the dead. Don't you love it when Paul just kind of slides that in there? So the very purpose of the affliction was to move Paul to a fuller, deeper faith in God, and, and then which would ultimately bring glory to God. But he needed to get him his focus off himself. We find this so often when people come with problems that they're so burdened with their problems. You know that one of the first things we have, all, all people do that come to the center is we have them start serving others. You know what? When you start focusing on others, it's pretty hard to focus on yourself all the time. And that is what the problem is in our culture. We are so self-focused and not others-oriented that we start, actually, I, if I start looking at myself, I can get pretty depressed. You know, so, but when I start serving others, um, that, will, that will clearly bring me joy. And then we see in the next verse in 110, uh, in 2 Corinthians 1.10, he delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us on him. We have set our hope that he will deliver us again. So that's once again pushing us to set our... So that's what we want to, when we're counseling people, we want to let them know that the Lord is doing something in your life to focus, take your focus off whatever it is and put it on, put it on him. So let's look at, go over the book of Colossians where we're going to, just look at the centrality of Christ here for a few minutes and his gospel for all of living. Um, and, and essentially, all our counsel should be for the purpose of helping people live that Christ-like life. Um, that's really our desire and our goal. It isn't for someone who comes maybe, um, I mean, we have had, for a while we had a string of young women suffering from eating disorders, anorexia. And we had them come, and we had them, you know, sometimes we'd get a call from their mother, and they'd want to know, do you have there people there that are experts on anorexia? And we'd say, no. Um, we have people that know their Bibles. Um, they know the gospel. Um, and, by the way, we've had quite a few young women that have come here with anorexia, and they've left, like, um, 20 pounds heavier and really filled with joy. Oh, okay, maybe I'll send my daughter. <laughs> And we have had any number of those come over the years. And it's a joy. It is a joy seeing how many times those young women, and I'm not putting them all, I'm not putting them all in the same box. I'm just many times I watch as my wife dis discipled those young women and how their focus moved from them and their, their looks or their body or whatever they were focused on to Christ and how they were freed, freed from what they had been, some of them, one, one young girl, their parents were ready to mortgage their farm and send her to a ministry that charged $9,000 a month for her to be there. And they were not Christ-focused and they weren't actually biblically focused. So fortunately, um, but we did get, we have gotten any number of young women in those situations. But whatever the case is, whatever it is, whether it's depression, anxiety, um, any kind of addictions, young men with addictions. I mean, it's, it's in our life, that's what we live. So we saw that in Colossians 1, 3 through 5, Paul writes that faith in Christ and a love for one another and their hope of heaven all stem from the word of truth, the gospel. And we see the centrality of the gospel. Um, just, just flip over to Romans 5 with me, Romans 5. And keep your finger there in Colossians, we're coming right back. Romans 5, and we see how Paul brings faith, hope, and love together, which spring into a joyful, peaceful, God-glorifying life for the believer, even in the midst of suffering. Even in the midst of suffering. Which I think, by the way, we're headed for. <laughs> and if you don't think this country is headed for that, you're living under a rock. Right? It's coming. It is coming. We think, we think five, what, I used, to, I used to say $3 gallon gas, then I said $4 gallon gas, now I'm saying $5 gallon gas. We think that's bad. Well, just go overseas. 
you know, the last time I was in Hungary, I was in Hungary, I think two years, maybe, yeah, two and a half years ago, it was $6 a gallon. You know, so we're not, we're not there yet. Anyway, Romans 5, 1 through 5, follow as I read. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have been justified by faith alone in Christ alone, not through any of your works. If any of you are, are out there working and doing good works, hoping you will be made right with God, I have news for you. It is not. You cannot get right with God through good works. It is only through faith in Christ alone that we are justified. That's what he says. We have been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. What on earth is going on? How can you rejoice in your sufferings? Well, read on. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. My definition for hope, it isn't like, I hope I get home today after I preach here. That's, that's kind of wishing, all right? <laughs> um, no, B biblical definition of hope is a present appropriation of a future and joyous certainty. In other words, I live today with what I know to be true tomorrow. Okay, that's, that's biblical hope. I'll just throw that in. That's free. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. And Paul goes on in verse 6 and on and explains the gospel, that which is the basis for all this, our reconciliation with God through faith in his Son, Jesus Christ, for our sins, saving us from the wrath of God caused by us, uh, our sin, and then rejoicing in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I just want to stop here and ask a, a, a question. Is this person who is joyful, peaceful, filled with hope, enduring with joy in the sufferings of life, the kind of person you want to be? Well, if anybody said no, I'd say, well, I, maybe, you know, you need to hear it again, or maybe we need to have a talk, or maybe you're asleep, or <laughs> let me read it again, all right? Is this person we just read about, right, who is joyful, peaceful, filled with hope, enduring with joy in the sufferings of life, the kind of person you want to be? And I would say, that's, that's, that's what I, you know why? Because that's the life of Christ. That's why I want to live like that, because that, Christ suffered for us, and yet, he was, he was joyful. He was joyful. It's Christ-like living, and it's available to every, every single believer through the power of the gospel. Jesus said in, in John 15, 11, he says, These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Well, what was he speaking back then? He was giving commands, love one another, lay your lives down for one another. And he, and he says, the reason I'm telling you this isn't because I want you to live a life which is, oh, brother, here we go again, another rule I got to buy. I got to, no, no. He says, I'm telling you to love your brother and sister, lay your life down for each other, serve one another in the gospel. Why? So that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. That's, that's pretty good. I love that. I love that because that is the source of my joy. John 14, 27, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. And then back in Colossians 1, 27, to them God chose to make known the great among the Gentiles, the riches of the glory of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So if you're a believer today, you have the spirit of Christ living in you. You know, when we use those words, Jesus in my heart, and things like that, many times people don't understand it. Jesus, Jesus actually has a body. You know, he ascended to heaven with a body. He will come back as he went, according to the book of Acts. Um, Jesus, physically, is not in me. But the Spirit of Christ, according to Romans 8, is in me if I'm saved. If you have not the Spirit of Christ, you have not Christ. That's what he says in Romans 8 9. So the Spirit of Christ living in us, and what does he say here? He says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is our hope. I, I, I have done many uh, memorial services and funerals over the years for believers that I really believe that they live their life for Christ. I really believe they were believers. And unbelievers, you know, that the town calls you, oh, we need a pastor to do a funeral. Would you do the funeral? I do basically the same funeral. 
If it's an unbeliever that I don't know anything about, I don't mention the guy in the box at all. I preach the gospel. And I, I, you know, I just preach the gospel and I've seen people come to Christ at funerals. But what a joy it is to do a, a funeral, a memorial service for a believer that's been serving the Lord. I mean, it's a celebration. They're home. Their work is done. They're rejoicing and they don't want to come back. So never think that. So when we look at this, all that what this ha has to do with church counseling philosophy, it's got everything to do with it because it first starts with us, every one of us, as a part of the local church. That is, no one is excluded. Um, we would say, uh, our, our, with our problems that make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead, would we say that? We, wanna, we want people to see that in our lives. I'm not relying on myself. I'm relying on the God who raises the dead. Um, but we as a church cannot give away what we do not possess. And that's why I'm encouraging you to get into the scriptures, get a knowledge of the scriptures, read, meditate on the scriptures, have a quiet time every day. I never had a quiet time. I didn't come to Christ until I was in my 30s. And then I went to Bible school when I was 37. And some of you are familiar with Word of Life Bible Institute. I went there when I was 37 years old. And you know what? They made me have a quiet time because I got marked on my quiet time every day. And you know what happened? I got into that habit. And now, you know, this morning, I meet with the, the, our, our staff at Adirondack Bible Chapel at 6 o'clock on Sunday mornings for an hour of prayer. Um, before that, that means, you know, Sunday morning, 6 o'clock, i got to be there. That means i got to get up right around quarter to five if I'm going to have my hour of study uh, in the Word. Um, it just became a habit. I can't live without it. You know, I just back up wherever I have to leave, back it up a good hour, and then have that time in the Word. And what you'll find is you'll grow, and you'll be filled with that joy, and then you will want others to have, to have that. So having that in our lives, it starts with us, our lives, our marriages, our victory over sin, our loving one another deeply, all of those things is, is that uh, Christ-centered biblical counseling model that is seen within the church. It isn't something you take on paper and you say, okay, here, go do this. It's, it is our lives. So after Paul tells the Colossians he's heard of their faith and their love for one another and their hope in heaven, then he writes this prayer for them, verses 9, Colossians 1, 9 and 10. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with knowledge, the knowledge of his will, and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as, so I could be real smart, <laughs> and I can show up the other guy, and I can be the answer man? No, that's not what he's saying. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. So I'm doing this, I'm studying. Yes, am I going to be able to help others? Yes, but see the purpose, he, Paul's praying, he's, he's saying, I want you filled with knowledge and all spiritual wisdom, because it'll change your life. It'll change your life. You'll be a different person. The Ed Hart standing here right now, I can't tell you how different that is than the Ed Hart back when I was at AT&T. You didn't want to be around me. The Lord had to take all kinds of things out of me when I came to Christ. And a lot of that was just spending time in Scripture. And then we read, fully pleasing Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing, once again, increasing in the knowledge of God. Next, we see that if anyone would be competent to counsel another brother or sister, it would be the one who lives that life, as Paul prayed, filled with the knowledge of his will and spiritual wisdom. So this is not some select group. I just want to encourage you. We have people in our church that are counseling others that have said to me, I never thought I would sit down with another brother who was going through a very difficult time and counsel. We have uh, an elder who um, many years ago, his son was murdered. And I remember when it happened. They f it, actually, he and his wife found his son um, murdered. Tragic. They have five boys. They say they still have five, one's in heaven. Um, but it was tragic. Well, they were wondering, what is the Lord going to do with this? They bought a house. He retired in, in uh, Speculator. And he started coming to our church. And now, you know, whenever we have someone come to the ministry center who has suffered a loss and we have had those people grieving 
um, children who have lost their parents, parents who have lost children. Who do we go to? Guess who? The one who has walked through that with Christ and is living victoriously today. The two of them are living victoriously, and it didn't, it didn't take them out. So we see that it's just us. It's, it's not a select group of experts. We're an expert society, aren't we? Get an expert for everything. Oh, I need an expert for, you know, I, we, we're amazed at the ministry center. We get a bunch of young men, and you know most of the young men that come don't know which end of the screwdriver to hold. I mean, it's amazing to me. They just don't know. They don't know anything. You know, you hand them a hammer, and it's like, uh. So we take them into the auto shop. We say, we're going we're gonna, to, you know, do a brake job. And they're like, whoa, whoa no. You are going to do a break job. I'll, I'll tell you what to do. It's really amazing, isn't it? But they don't. They don't know um, what's going on, and so we try to instruct them. And it's the same thing in our spiritual life, isn't it? We get these young people, and it isn't like I'm just going to tell you what to do. No, you're going to do it with me. So you come, and, and, you, and you work on that. We don't need an expert. We don't have to have uh, somebody with six degrees up their arm to come in and tell us how to do this. That wasn't what happened here. Actually, what we read about the disciples in, in Acts chapter 4, we read that they were what? Uneducated, ordinary men, but they had been with Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that encouraging? Now, I'm not against education. I encourage people to go and get all the education they can, but I'm just telling you, don't think if you, if you don't have a Bible degree or a seminary degree that you can't, you can't counsel. You can. So we see that in Actually, Colossians was written. One of the reasons it was written, Paul wrote it because there were false teachers saying, you need some kind of higher knowledge, all right? It's, it's more than really what's in here. This is good. This is okay. It's just not sufficient. So you need a higher knowledge. Oh, and by the way, we're the ones that have that higher knowledge. Does it sound anything like our government today? <laughs> Maybe not the church, but the government, right? Um, come to us. We'll tell you how to live. <laughs> No, no thanks. Um, but anyway, so that was going on in the church of Colossae at that time. So Paul is saying, you, <laughs> I'm telling you folks, you don't need these guys, all right? You don't need that higher knowledge. What you need, everything you need is right here. It's right here. And that's, what, that's Paul's point. Uh, the, su the sufficiency of Scripture, the supremacy of Christ. Look at Colossians 2, 8, and 9, if you have your Bible over to Colossians. And Paul attacks this heresy. And look at what he says in Colossians 2, 8, 9. You tell me if this doesn't apply today. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. You see the contrast there? <laughs> he, he says, Don't let anybody take you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies of this world. And that, that depend on human, they've, they've come up with them. Humans have come up with them. Or the basic principles of this world, and sometimes that's referring to some of the basic laws of what we're supposed to do, rather than on Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. And that should encourage us. If you're a believer, right? In him lives the whole fullness of deity, that is the fullness of God, Jesus Christ, fully God, fully human, right? Hard for us to understand, that's what Scripture teaches, right? So in him, all of that deity dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled in him. <laughs> you are united with Christ. If you're a believer, you are united with Christ. You know why God looks at you, if you're a believer this morning, and I hope you all are, you know why God looks at you as righteous? I don't know what your name is. Yeah, you. Sure. What was your name? Tracy. That's my daughter's name. I have a daughter, Tracy. Now, I don't know your heart, but I'm just going to say, do you realize, if you are trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, that when God looks at you, you know what he sees? Uh, have you ever sinned, Tracy? I'm not going to ask you what ones, okay? Don't worry. Right? There's an honest woman who just said, yes, I have, okay? You know what God sees when he looks at you? The Father sees when he looks at you. 
He sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees pure, pure righteousness. doesn't get any more righteous than Jesus Christ. That's what he sees. If you're united with Christ, that's what he sees, the righteousness of Christ. I don't care what your history is. I know my history. I could never pay for my sins myself, right, ever. If I lived a thousand years, I never could. But you know what God the Father sees when he looks at that heart? He sees the righteousness of Christ because I'm united with Christ. And you, if you are a believer this morning, you are united with Christ. And that's, that's why we read those precious words. You've been filled in him. You, he and you, you and him, you're united with Christ. So if you go and sin today, Tracy, I don't think you will, okay? But, but let's say you did. Let's say you just had a sinful thought. I'm going to hear and tell you something. That you know what? Jesus Christ died for that sin 2,000 years ago. And you are seen as righteous in Christ. Now, Paul says in Romans 6, oh, well then, I can go, I, that means I can go sin and do whatever I want. He says, no, no, you died to sin. How can you live in it anymore? That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that any sin, past, present, or future, when you're not united with Christ, that righteousness of Christ, you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Doesn't that give you comfort? It should. That's the only way we're going to make it to heaven because only righteous people go to heaven. And there is none righteous, no, not one, according to Romans 3, right? Except for those of us who are in Christ, through faith in Christ, then we, are, we possess the righteousness of Christ. We're united with him. What a wonderful thought that is. Anyway, back in 110, Paul goes on. I'm almost done, right? Um, Paul goes on in his prayer, praying to, for the Colossians who are filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Would they go on and walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge? These are the people in the church who are qualified to counsel others. So does he say there's only a few of those? He's writing this to the whole church. He's saying, if you've experienced the righteousness of Christ through faith in Christ, and you're born again by the Spirit of God through faith in Christ, and you're, you're going, doesn't mean you have to have a full knowledge of the Scripture. I, I read things, I've been studying this for 35 years, and I'm still going, whoa, I didn't see that before. I've read through the Bible I don't know how many times, and just putting this sermon together and studying it, I'm going, whoa, that's so cool. You know, I'm, every day I'm opening up things. So you don't have to know it all, but you do need to know something, right? And it should be the basics of what you find in Scripture. Start out with the Gospel and learn who God is, His attributes, by reading Scripture, and then learn what, how that affects my life as I walk by the Spirit of God who lives in me, as I that's live by the power of the Spirit of God in me, I will not gratify the desires of the flesh. There's the answer to sin. And I'll be filled with the fruit of the Spirit, which is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You think that's a pretty attractive person? Would you run away or towards that person? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, full, uh, gentleness. I lost my place. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Okay? <laughs> Got to say it fast. Right? That's a picture of Christ, isn't it? You know, in all my years of counseling, I never had a woman come in and say, I'm leaving my husband. He is too joyful, has way too much peace, he loves me too much, patient. Oh, man, is he patient. Oh, forever. And self-control, you wouldn't believe the self-control. And he has been so faithful, I'm out of here. Never heard that happen. You know, amazing in 40 years, actually 40 years of counseling now. I've never had that happen. Oh, but I've had the deeds of the flesh listed to me many times. You see, as we live Christ, then the fruit of the Spirit comes out, and people see that fruit. You know, I mean, I, I tell Christians if you have the joy of the Lord in your heart, let your face know it. You know, I mean, why? We shouldn't be walking around, well, I'm a Christian. Woe is me. I'm under this burden. Jesus said, I'm telling you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. You want to be joyful? <laughs> uh, don't we search for joy, really? 
in all the wrong places. That's what we counsel. We counsel people to the joy of the Lord, to find joy in Christ. That's why we don't... I have had young men come to me with, name a problem. I don't name a problem. I mean, there are a hundred of them out there. Anywhere from, you know, same-sex attraction to go all the way to pornography to um, drinking, drugs, I don't care what. You know what? I can go through weeks of counsel with that young man and never mention his problem. You know why? Because I'm not focused on his problem. I don't care what your problem is. You all have one, or two, or three, or ten, if you're anything like me. It doesn't matter. I want to focus on the answer. So you know what I'm going to do in, in Christian counseling, biblical counseling? I am going to take you to where the answers are, and that is Jesus Christ and his word and the gospel and the power of Christ in you, the hope of glory, who wants to bring you joy. So that's, that's pretty wonderful, I think. So if you are thinking about Am I Competent to Counsel, the title of Jay Adams' book that I read years and years ago, he focuses in on Romans 15, 14, and I'll just say it to you. It's, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness. Well, what does that mean? I'm living a perfect life? No. You're just full of goodness. You're not full of evil. Okay, you're full of goodness. You want to do the right thing, and you're doing the things that, that would bring that about. Full of goodness and complete in knowledge, and the word complete there is an ongoing uh, picture, present perfect tense, which says, I'm constantly getting more knowledge. Okay, I'm seeking after that knowledge of the Word of God. Remember, in Christ are hidden all the wisdom and knowledge, so I'm seeking Christ, not reading books on counseling necessarily. I'm reading where, where I, the real answers, right? And then he says, incompetent to, and I'll tell you the different translations here, competent to instruct, all right? That's one of them. Competent to admonish, that's another one. One another, okay? So if you look at, I'm, you're filled with goodness, you're filled with knowledge, you are competent. The word, the, the Greek word there is nutheo, and nutheo basically is uh, taking people and admonishing them and encouraging them and instructing them in the Word of God, which we call counsel. All right? You're competent to counsel if you are, if you are living your faith. Don't counsel somebody. To, you really need to get into the Word of God and spend a quiet time every day. If you don't do it yourself, they're going to figure it out sooner or later, and they're going to say, you know, I was, when I knew Jack Wurtson, and I knew him for years, and I used to travel with him once in a while, and the first thing he'd do when you get in the car with Jack, you know what he'd say to you? What'd you get out of your quiet time this morning? Boy, you better have had one. Okay, because if you sat there and went, um, well, you know, we're leaving kind of early, Jack. I didn't, <laughs> you know, I didn't get up really to have a quiet time yet. <laughs> you know, he was not going to be a happy camper. Well, then what he would do is tell you what he got out of his quiet time, and he'd preach to you all the way you were driving. <laughs> But that's, you know, that's the idea is it becomes such a habit that, that you now are just encouraging others. If I was up here filled with gloom, would you be smiling at me when I mentioned joy? You'd, you'd probably be going, that guy's an idiot, okay? And I don't see any joy in him. He's a hypocrite, right? All I can tell you is my wife brings me great joy. My three daughters bring me great joy. My nine grandchildren bring me great joy. My one great-grandchild brings me great joy. But I'm going to tell you something else. They can't give me the sustaining joy that Christ gives me. And that is, that comes from the Spirit of Christ living in us, the power of His, His strength. So we want to admonish one another. Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Teaching and admonishing one another. Same word there. New that out. Teaching and counseling one another. All right? In all wisdom. Singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That's so cool. We have a, we have a young black lady living with us right now, and it's so cool because uh, she likes to listen to Christian hip-hop, which I was not introduced to um, until she actually came and started living with us. And I started living, listening to it, and I thoroughly enjoyed it because the words 
were so solid and, and biblical, um, I had to get a little used to the music. You know, it was a little different, okay? But here, and you know, my wife has a, a convertible. She lets me drive it once in a while, you know? So I said, you know what we got to do, honey? We're going to put this hip-hop on. And we're going to go into Speculator to the, to the ice cream place, you know, where everybody congregates. And we're going to pull up at Blaring. And they're going to go, what on earth happened to Ed and Faith? <laughs> but let me tell you something. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, just because a culture's music is a little different, don't put it down. Listen to the words of some of that. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Um, Shylin, Shylin. If you listen to Christian hip hop, Shylin, you're gonna have, you're gonna get a Bible lesson. You're gonna get theology, all right? It's gonna be from the get go. Shylin for kids. You know what it is? Creation, walking through the Bible. And, you know, it's just different. It's different. Okay. Um, I know the people. If we did that in town, I know what the people would say. They'd say, "We know what that is. That's that black girl you got living with you. She's in, she's influencing you." And I'd say, "Yes, she is." <laughs> It's for the good. <laughs> we have a wonderful time with her. Anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here because we're, what we're going to do next week is we're going to look at the second part, the power behind gospel-centered, Christ-centered counseling. All right? So we'll look, we'll look at that and that power that I want everyone here to experience, not just in your own life. I want you to experience it in your own life. If you don't experience it in your own life, you can't give it away. You cannot give away something that you do not own and you don't have. And we know this is a gift of God and he's given it to us and we need to then give it out. So we don't all have to become professional counselors. I'm not saying your church has to start a counseling ministry. What I'm saying is when my brother here sits down with another man over a cup of coffee and he says, you know, I got this real real problem going on at home. He is going to counsel that brother from the Word of God. He doesn't have to start quoting Bible verses to him. He's going to listen. He's going to find out, what, where's this guy's heart? What's going on? Okay, Lord, help me. And before I go to those meetings, I say, Lord, prepare me. I've walked into meetings. I walked into one where a woman called me up. She said, my husband is down in the basement. He has a loaded gun. He says he's going to kill himself, and he just fired one round. Could you come over? <laughs> well, I went over and we got him out of the basement and we talked to him and then we sat and we talked about, you know, how do we handle things like that biblically from the Word of God through the power of Christ. You ever scared when you go into those situations? You bet. But, you know, it's all relative, right? We serve a God who can raise the dead. <laughs> so, so we'll keep doing that. So next week, next week we'll look at the power, the power, because we need power behind us. We can't do this in our own, own strength, right? We're told in, in, second, in 1 Peter 1, 11, we're told to serve with the strength that God provides so that in all things God will be glorified. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness. And you, you do it by your divine power the power that spoke this universe into existence, the power that rose Jesus from the dead, that same power you give us that we can live this life victoriously. And then we can help others. We can take each other's hand and help them through the most difficult times. And we can live this life filled with the joy of Christ in us. Looking forward to that day when we meet him face to face. What a day that'll be. Father, until that happens, I pray that you would strengthen this church, encourage these dear believers here. I pray that if there's anyone here this morning that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, has never turned to Christ in repentance, turned from their sin and turned to Christ for salvation, believing in his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of their sin, that today would be the day of salvation. And even right now, they would say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I'm going to trust in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this time we could have this morning together. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.